Greetings and welcome everyone. I'm Nicola Dyer, Senior Advisor and Secretariat Manager of the Global Seaweed Coalition. It is my pleasure to guide this conversation today. On behalf of the coalition, I'm truly delighted to welcome you all to our third scientific webinar of 2023. This one is on seaweed and methane reduction, growing asparagopsis for impact. So first, a few words about the Global Seaweed Coalition for those of you who don't yet know us. We're a global partnership established to support the safety and sustainable scale up of the, of the seaweed industry as it scales up and to unite a fragmented market through a unified vision and goals grounded in science. We do that through our four action pillars, funding, advocacy, science and technology and policy. We provide seed funding for projects. We spread the seaweed narrative in global, national, and local forums. We share knowledge about scientific and technological developments and good practices in the industry. And we drive and influence policy change from local to global levels. The coalition was launched in March 2021 as the Safe Seaweed Coalition with initial funding of three million pounds for an initial three years from Lloyd's Register Foundation and support from the French National Research Center and United Nations Global Compact, which now houses the coalition. So far, we've delivered 1.1 million euros in co two competitive calls for proposals and our third call is now open. More details on that at the end of this webinar. Global Seaweed Coalition members represent the entire seaweed value chain from smallholder farmers to multinational businesses, specialized research institutes to intergovernmental organizations, working together to realize the full potential of, seaweed, of the seaweed sector and to ensure its sa safety for consumers, workers, and the environment. So let's have a couple of housekeeping details before we get into the substance of the event. Throughout, please feel free to post questions or comments in the chat. Azadine, our communications manager, please put up your hands when I call on you there. Melanie, our scientific officer, and Sophia, our project coordinator, will be monitoring the chat and will either respond directly in the chat or flag them to me so we can put them through to Professor Paul. Nick Paul is our speaker, and we also are privileged to have Leonardo Mata as well speaking. So we can put them through to either Nick Paul or to uh, Leonardo Mata after their presentations. And by the way, even though we're all very familiar with Zoom calls at this point, a gentle reminder to please stay muted unless called upon. So now, turning to our event. The objective is to provide scientific information about methane reduction, and especially the impact of the seaweed asparagopsis in this field. So we note that other seaweeds may offer a similar benefit on methane reduction. Our keynote speaker, Professor Nick Paul, will share the latest results of his group's deep dive into this complex and controversial topic. Maybe controversial, maybe not, let's see. In addition, Dr. Leonardo Mata, who is also working on growing asparagopsis in Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands, will briefly introduce his work and be present to answer your questions throughout the Q&A. So let me briefly take you through the agenda. First, our scientific director, Philippe Potin, will give a brief introduction to the scientific work of the coalition and our scientific advisory council before introducing our keynote speaker, Professor Paul. And Professor Paul will speak for about 30 minutes, followed by uh, Dr. Mata, then we'll open the floor for about 10 minutes for them to take questions from the chat and perhaps even from the floor. Philippe, over to you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to, to, to start uh, this introduction uh, of our speaker. So I would just say a few words about uh, 
the scientific uh, collective work we are developing at the, the, in the within the coalition. The, this webinar is part of this uh, collective uh, scientific uh, expertise we are trying to establish for uh, developing the, the, the seaweed sector globally. So, of course, we are supporting a lot of uh, different uh, scientific aspects uh, within the coalition, making bridges between uh, uh, basic science and uh, applied sciences around seaweeds. And we are focusing uh, on the, the, some aspect of safety, uh, thanks to our uh, f um, uh, funding, uh, um, also um, uh, funder, which was the Lloyd Register Foundation, which, which in, in fact uh, is supporting uh, actions which uh, will improve uh, the food and consumer safety, but also uh, the environmental safety, and also the, the safety for, for workers. So this is really uh, f f f fitting very well with the seaweed sector, in which we have uh, many challenges to tackle. And during the first uh, phases of uh, the Safe Seaweed Coalition, we have tried to support uh, scientific work and and, uh, and the development, which uh, will uh, bring some uh, development uh, for much more um, harmonization in the standardization of uh, some uh, important uh, safety issues for seaweeds, uh, including, of course, for the food safety and the, the problem of contaminants, but also uh, how safe could be the development of uh, other activities. And to strengthen the, the, this uh, scientific activity, we have decided to really uh, uh, create a, a full scientific uh, council which will be completely independent from uh, the private sectors. And we will uh, work uh, together to guide the, 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 the scientific uh, uh, development of uh, the coalition to provide uh, advices uh, for, for different de development and policies. And uh, the, the activities of this new scientific council are if, of course to, to, to animate uh, the, the, the the possibility to have uh, some uh, events like this webinar, but also some uh, larger uh, events, which uh, could be also within some uh, other initiative uh, provided by uh, international organization, to, for, like uh, in the food sector or in, a, in the UN organization, which are organizing different events. And uh, we have uh, now a collective expertise, which, uh, which is provided by this uh, scientific council, which will be able to, of course, uh, guide the selection of a new project funded by the coalition, uh, but also to provide some uh, advices which uh, will uh, be in the context of, um, um, in fact, developing the, um, what we, much more, uh, in fact, uh, ethical reflection for, for the seaweed sectors. So uh, we are cooperating uh, together with uh, all the scientists uh, involved in this uh, scientific council to um, think about uh, developing some position papers and uh, which will, uh, in fact, uh, provide uh, the, the guidance for, for, for the seaweed sectors. But um, I think the, it's uh, much more important now to focus on our webinar. Uh, the, the question we, we will uh, uh, address uh, today is a very important question for the seaweed sector. As Nicola was mentioning, it could be a debatable uh, question, uh, especially due to the fact that we are dealing with some molecules which were identified to be active uh, to prevent um, the development of uh, the meta meta metagenic flora in uh, the remain of uh, ruminants, and uh, which, uh, in fact, uh, could have also some other uh, uh, effects on the, on the physiology of animals or or even uh, uh, having some other uh, environmental impacts. So this is why we decided to invite uh, today Professor Nicolas Paul from uh, the Sunshine Coast uh, University and Leonard Nobata to, to provide some uh, scientific um, uh, vision of uh, what is uh, the current research, especially on asparagopsis, because asparagopsis is a species which is uh, attracting the much more, the, the largest interest uh, worldwide, but uh, but which could also uh, answer to some questions about uh, the development of um, the, 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 the potential of other uh, seaweeds, uh, which could also be rich in uh, bromoform or other related compounds, and which could also provide solution, and which could also be much more easy uh, to uh, to grow in the, the future because uh, there is many challenges uh, which are around the, uh, the domestication of asparagopsis which are not yet uh, uh, um, uh, solved and uh, I'm sure that uh, what we will heard from uh, uh, Nicola and uh, Leonardo will help us to, to understand much more what could be done for the development of asparagopsis as, as, as part of the solution. So 
thank you, Nicola, for Nick. I will say uh, for accepting to 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 provide this um, uh, keynote uh, talk to today, and to really. Uh, um, uh, uh, I like what we have you you have developed during the I say the last twenty five years because we started very early to uh, your interest in aspergopsis uh, during your PhD thesis and you started also the collaboration with Rocky Denis uh, during this uh, PhD thesis so it's a long story and I'm sure you will provide very interesting uh, vision about uh, what could be the future developments. So thank you, Nicola, to start. And then thank you, Leonardo, to also continue after um, after Nicola, and especially to highlight what you are developing presently in uh, in some islands and in, uh, in, in um, countries in Southeast Asia. So thank you. Nicola, the floor is the, yours. Thank you so much, Philippe, and also uh, to Nicola for that uh, kind introduction. So it was funny listening to Nicola introduce the, the topic as being controversial because I, I understand that, of course, for, and, and Philippe touched on it as well. But to be honest, all of the work that I do is very seaweed focused and the challenges and the technical parts and the team uh, that we have at the University of the Sunshine Coast is working on many of those technical and environmental and sometimes social uh, problems. So that's really probably going to be the, the main uh, story that I'll be presenting today. And the title reflects a bit of that in terms of growing asparagopsis for impact. And impact for me means the triple bottom line of environment, of social impact as well as economic point of view. So I represent a, a much broader group of people uh, at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And just to touch on that uh, briefly, uh, we have more than 30 uh, people, both staff and students, working on all aspects of seaweed um, here in Australia, but also across the Indo-Pacific. And we have four pillars of work uh, on the production and processing side, uh, a lot of biotechnology and omics, so genomics, as well as transcript, um, transcriptomics, environment and restoration angle, as well as uh, looking at food, nutrition and livelihoods. But a large portion of those uh, staff and students are actually working on asparagopsis, and that provides a really good foundation uh, for the work. And I'll, I'll go into uh, a, a lot of that technical detail as well to share some of those uh, new insights, which I think is always great to do in this type of forum. But really, to start with, I've got to step back a little bit and talk about seaweed for cows. It doesn't take much these days to log online uh, to have something about seaweed being used uh, for cattle to reduce uh, methane uh, from uh, their digestion. It's a big uh, and important issue, uh, reducing uh, methane in, across the globe. And the things that we tend to see, though, are always uh, front and centre in the media, coming from the business point of view, coming from different angles, uh, whether it's uh, a new type of uh, burger that's just basically been created from a collaboration, the world's most sustainable beef burger, the world's first beef produced from reduced methane methods for the mints, the world's first ever red seaweed supplement to reduce for dairy, as well as a world first um, wool production uh, when it comes to uh, production of, of sheep. So these things all come together in what really from a media point of view and a tagline is hyperbole. It's always about a giant impact, immense impact. And of course, it's not just businesses uh, that are doing this. The Australian government has heavily invested in trying to work out ways of dealing uh, with methane. So the moment that I saw this dairy cow sitting there with a bit of red seaweed in its mouth in some advertising just before our federal election a couple of years ago, I almost fell off my chair and realised how mainstream it is that we're, uh, we're the topic that we're working on. And when it all boils down to it, it really is everyone, rightly or wrongly, 
searching for a silver bullet. So when I quickly snapped uh, how to get a, an image of a silver bullet, the funny thing that popped up was the type of beer that, and Philippe mentioned 25 years ago when I started uh, my studies on asparagopsis was actually the beer I remember that the lab was drinking. So I thought that was very timely and clearly I was supposed to be giving this talk right now. But let's take a, a further step back. Why is methane uh, such an important greenhouse gas to deal with and, and what is uh, the issue when it comes to livestock? And so the reality is we've got more than a billion cattle and many more sheep and goats and, and other ruminants that live on the globe. There's a whole lot of short and long-lived greenhouse gases, and the two most important, of course, that we tend to talk about, carbon dioxide as well as methane. And the reason why methane is so much, uh, gets a lot of airtime, is that especially over the next uh, 20 years, it is 80 times worse in, in terms of its warming potential. And just to put that into perspective, when we look at various types of plots and the like, we can see that when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, um, and the red bar is the CO2 and the grey bar is methane. But beef uh, is really one of the main culprits for release, but as well as the different types of food of chocolate, of course, dairy and beef, dairy and lamb and goats. Seabed, on the other hand, is going to be right down the bottom here. And so this wonderful combination potentially of a low um, carbon footprint feedstock influencing the negative carbon footprint of beef and other ruminants has been a really compelling story that people have taken up far wider than I could have ever imagined when we first started working on that. And it's about to happen again. We're about to have a new uh, COP28 uh, in the UAE, uh, and that'll be, I'm sure, uh, touched on the Global Methane Pledge, which was back from COP26 in 2021. So it's this recurring theme uh, and some of the different countries, especially in Australia, are getting on board with trying to set up realistic targets about how to actually deal with this problem. And so the Australian red meat industry, for example, has a carbon neutral goal uh, by 2030, and they're doing all different types of things for it. So a brief history of how asparagopsis for cows started, I think is important at this point. And Philippe touched on that I was uh, working with Rocky Denice uh, at James Cook University. And at that time, Nigel Tompkins from the CSIRO, which is our federal scientific organisation, uh, reached out uh, to Rocky and, and asked of whether there, there are a whole range of seaweeds that we could look at to see whether feeding a small amount of seaweed to, to cows could actually reduce methane. What we found was astonishing and still uh, talked about in terms of being remarkable for in vitro studies where there's basically rumen fluid uh, inside a jar uh, where the seaweed and other different types of algae that we were screening were added. Over 72 hours, there was this 90%, 99% reduction in methane, and that was uh, the first publication uh, that we did in 2014. Following up from that, uh, Lorena Machado, a PhD student at the time, also identified that bromoform was the main uh, compound that was responsible for that methane reduction in asparagopsis. And I'd done quite a bit of work on asparagopsis at that time for my, uh, prior, prior to that time for my PhD, uh, looking at the culture, looking at chemi chemical ecology. Uh, and basically the two main species of asparagopsis, there's a warm water one, asparagopsis taxiformis, and a cool water one, asparagopsis armata. Both of those species, to, irrespective of which life history stage, whether it's gametophyte or a filamentous sporophyte, all produce bromoform as the major compound. So this was something that was quite astonishing in terms of the impact of uh, asparagopsis. Uh, and there's nothing else that comes close at that particular dose. And that's why it's got so much attention uh, and people have been screening more and more since. Just to touch on some of the key findings that move from that laboratory in vitro uh, work into the um, in vivo, so live animal uh, findings. So basically for both uh, species of asparagopsis, uh, there was work done by the CSIRO to show um, its impact in sheep. Uh, there was work done by UC Davis in 2019 to show uh, reductions in dairy. Uh, and there was also work published in 2020 with CSIRO animals um, showing reduction again in beef 
but really importantly, uh, a weight gain uh, as well from adding it in. And it was postulated at the time that that weight gain was due to the energy that was originally being diverted by the archaea, so the ancient microbes that are in the rumen, uh, could instead be used uh, by the animal. And that created this productivity, really exciting um, bolt on to uh, the profound impact of asparagopsis itself reducing methane. At that time, because of the commercial interests, uh, there was also a patent that was submitted back in uh, uh, two th or before 2015, but it was first published in uh, 2015, a method for reducing methane. Uh, there was a lot of attention. Uh, the media and National Geographic, a sprinkle of uh, seaweed deflating cows and more about seaweed saving the world. Everyone gets very excited about this. And the CSIRO started a company called Future Feed um, around uh, about 2020, but we're doing uh, the work to get that company formed from 2018 or so. And they now have licensees around the world on using that, that pattern, so that using the method for uh, reducing methane. It hasn't all been smooth sailing. That earlier work from 2014 on, uh, yield some really promising results in, uh, that were replicated multiple occasions uh, in the laboratory and also re reproduced in many instances in, with uh, live animal trials uh, around the world. On the back of that, and this uh, number has been talked about, uh, I think in Phyconomy recently as well, is basically hundreds of millions of dollars have been raised uh, for asparagopsis. For this thing that we had screened and happened to find back in uh, 2012, it was when we first did it, uh, has led to such a huge uh, investment from all different areas and different types of capital. But of course, with that significant investment and the, uh, the claims of what is going to be uh, done and what scale uh, has to be done at, there's been much more attention and a lot more scrutiny. And there are examples now popping up where uh, even that example that I presented at the very beginning of the um, low methane uh, mints being written up uh, in terms of being in meat and dairies top greenwashing tactics, for example. So this is the type of thing that starts to influence the, the discussion and the technical and other aspects that I really like. We're also managing having to uh, discuss uh, these different angles. On top of that, there's a very large portion uh, of the farming sector that don't necessarily want to deal uh, with this or don't believe there is an issue in the first place to deal with. And there's a regenerative agriculture push and really talking about reducing herd sizes and doing all these other things where the idea of putting a feed additive in um, becomes less and less important in their framing. All of that capital that's been raised and the companies that have started, there, there are dozens of them now around the world that uh, are talking about uh, doing seaweed, asparagopsis. Uh, the cost of producing the seaweed is, is becoming more and more of an issue um, as the practical realities of, of what we're talking about start to manifest. There are challenges when it comes to farming anything in the sea, let alone a new species that hasn't actually been developed. And that's being looked at uh, in Australia through the lens of um, also, where are we going to be farming this huge amount of uh, seaweed to service the Australian cattle, uh, which are more than 25 million? And we like to frame things in Australia as Sydney harbours, which are about 5,000 uh, hectares. So you'd need almost 10, uh, 10 Sydney harbours worth of area. And when you look around Australia, it's a big country with a lot of uh, sea uh, country as well. It's But that is ultimately going to be impeding on somebody somewhere. It's not necessarily a straightforward thing. There's lots of alternative ways um, being considered now to process the seaweed because freeze drying, which has been the, the main uh, method of trapping all of that bromoform and the other uh, halogenated compounds inside the seaweed so that it's not released pr prior to being fed to the cattle. Um, people are looking at uh, oils. But the reality is uh, that that cost is, is starting to permeate into discussions again. And even our federal government, after on one hand, uh, a year earlier talking about how important it was, on the second hand saying straight away that demonstrating that the seaweed is becoming prohibitively costly and it will be too great, which might explain the bulging eyes uh, in that uh, image of the cattle there. And then we have more uh, studies, which is 
great. It's how science works. People are, are supposed to be able to reproduce uh, all of this work in, in lots of different systems, in different feeding systems and like, but it would be naive to think that they're always going to have exactly the same result. But when the negative ones land, uh, that's very media worthy, of course. So we've had uh, a paper from Wanganen uh, University around animal welfare, uh, and then we had a, a recent study that was just covered in our media that I've grabbed a few uh, snaps of there, which actually showed for one of the uh, startup companies here in Australia using an asparagopsis oil uh, and doing it for 300 days, the longest ever trial uh, with Wagyu beef with one of Australia's biggest agricultural companies, only getting uh, a 29%, uh, 28% reduction uh, in, in methane and actually feed intake um, being reduced as well, which meant that the animals were, were slightly smaller. So these types of things are, again, uh, really sharpening the focus on well, we need to understand it more. We need to um, work on these problems uh, together to actually have a better understanding. Luckily, that's where the science comes in. One of the presentations that I gave earlier in the year, I, I showed a number of publications uh, about asparagopsis. Uh, in Scopus and, and explored that a little bit. Here I've got a, a slightly different uh, spin, but you can see immediately that almost, over, so over the last 50 years, the, the previous uh, four, first 40 years, it was pretty flat, a few papers every year um, about asparagopsis. There were, at that point, um, a couple of studies that were the very first studies when it came to using seaweed and, and algae to, with the idea, the notion of reducing methane. Uh, back in 2006, uh, microalgae, uh, a certain type of microalga, which was rich in DHA, the docosahexaenoic acid, the fatty acid, um, was, was used and had a potent effect. It was actually nowhere near as much of asparag as asparagopsis, but at the, the thinking at the time was that those um, polyunsaturated unsaturated fatty acids were responsible for a lot of reduction. That also was followed up with another study with ascophyllin, so a seaweed this time where the extract was actually being used. And again, it was a, a pretty solid reduction, much more than other things at the time, 20% uh, from memory. Um, but all of that really paled in, in significance compared to Machado, that first study where we showed in, in similar types of settings that it was a 99% reduction in methane because of those, those halo forms, so the halo, the halo methanes. And from that point on, there's been as many studies in the last 10 years on asparagopsis on all different aspects of its production and processing uh, angles as there was in the previous one. So we do know more. Uh, and our group is also working on knowing more in inverted commas because it's so important to be able to provide that, that scientific basis for a lot of claims. So just to give you a, an idea after that background of, of where we are uh, at the University of the Sunshine Coast in Australia, uh, in Queensland, the bottom of Queensland. Uh, a lot of our work uh, is at Moffat Beach, which is uh, a, a beach coastally here where the traditional owners are the Cubby 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 people, and they um, uh, cover the area from just north of Brisbane uh, all the way up to uh, what's known as Harvey Bay, and so along the east coast there. But the amazing thing is that this particular site, and when I moved from James Cook University, not that I'll tell my family this, but the main reason was that asparagopsis was here, and it was far more abundant than I'd ever seen in um, any other places for a significant portion of the year. So much so that when you look at Google Earth at times, you can see huge amounts of asparagopsis being washed up on the beach. It's a rather nice field site at times. Uh, and the area itself really allows us to go and do some environmental or ecological research as well as being able to go and sample and bring uh, back lots of samples uh, uh, to the laboratory to explore more and more things, um, the diversity of work that I'll, I'll go over now. One of the key foundations uh, that I think all, especially new agricultural crops, but of course all agricultural crops need, is to have a thorough understanding uh, of genomics because we need to be fast tracking things, moving them along far, uh, faster than they've ever done before. We don't have time uh, to, to wait and having being able to have uh, precision or guided uh, work that's helped with uh, the understanding of the genome and all of the, the gene expression is so important. Uh, so we recently, at the end of last year, published um, 
the first sort of high quality uh, genome for asparagopsis, which is now uh, listed in NCBI um, as the reference uh, uh, genome assembly for everyone to use. It's all there. There are a number of different lineages of asparagopsis. So even though we're talking about, say, asparagopsis taxiformis, there are at least six recognized, so formal taxonomic recognized uh, lineages. And some of those might actually be different enough to ultimately become new species. So it's quite important to remember that depending on where you are around the world, that fundamental understanding of the biological diversity of the samples that you're working on is really important. So the team uh, led by Scott Cummins and Min Zhao here at the university uh, did a whole lot of um, hybrid sequencing, so the long and short uh, sequencing to get that high quality genome that's now available. And so the, the genome itself, um, so all, all seaweed genomes are relatively small. So our bioinformatics friends love that because it seems so much easier to work with than the 3000 megabases or more that are in humans and the 2000 that are in uh, other crops. So uh, we've found that the genome size was 142 megabases. It's a bit more than chondrus. And uh, there's 11,000 protein encoding genes. So that means that there's 11,000 metabolites essentially that are being produced um, by the seaweed. And so that information is all sort of up and, and publicly available on Research Square. And you can see here the two different life history stages, the big fluffy plumose uh, gametophyte, which is uh, beautiful, although, to be honest, it's a bit pesky in the sense that it does cover a lot of the area. Uh, and then there's the small filamentous uh, sporophyte here, which is the one that you can take literally a little piece of and, and keep growing it eternally uh, in the laboratory. Um, so it's great for doing uh, lots of research on. And that's what we've been doing. One of the things, uh, and it's certainly important in Australia as, as well as overseas, is making sure that when you're doing anything from a biodiscovery point of view, as in finding um, new information from biological resources of countries, whether they're your own or the countries that you visit, is to make sure that you uh, are working uh, around that Nagoya pr uh, protocol. And so a lot of the work that we do, uh, with Asparagopsis anyway, is all covered with a formal biodiscovery plan and potential benefit sharing agreement um, down the track with the uh, the government. So it's just something to be aware of when it comes to, to working in different places. From that, we've, we've done a lot of different types of work um, on the molecular side. This is one of the filaments of, um, of the Sparagopsis, and right there is what's known as a tetrasporangia. So there's a, a package, a tetrad of four spores that are being produced, which will ultimately go on to become that large, fluffy uh, plumose gametophyte that I mentioned. And uh, our student, Rini Patwari, she's published sort of the first proteomic study on asparagopsis uh, earlier this year, looking at both the gametophyte and the sporophyte. It's all there in open access so that people can see it, uh, looking for reproduction associated genes. So can we target particular genes and can we understand how they're controlled? finding uh, interesting things like a lot of enzymes that are being produced by asparagopsis that seem to relate to being able to bind metals. So it might be one of the reasons why they can grow in uh, relatively tough areas, as well as a whole lot of other, um, what our molecular friends have said are very interesting uh, proteins that might actually be useful in things like biomaterials. So that endless array of things that we can do with seaweed uh, continues. A lot of that work um, that we did in the environmental point of view was to understand the bromoform uh, concentration in the seaweed. So the, the fundamental premise of why asparagopsis is so much more powerful than any other seaweed is that it has a very, very high concentration of bromoform uh, relative to all other uh, algae uh, in its uh, tissue and because it stores it inside these specialised structures known as gland cells. Um, the, the key there to note is that all algae actually produce um, brain form. It's, it's one of the, the responses uh, to photosynthesis to mop up a lot of the free radicals, like hydrogen peroxide and the like. But asparagops is the only one that we, we know of that stores bromoform uh, inside uh, the, the cells of the seaweed at a concentration that can be up to a couple of percent depending on the conditions. So with that in mind, it's really interesting to note that after in hundreds of samples that we took uh, throughout the year, is that the average concentration of bromoform was almost as low as point uh, or half a percent of its dry weight. Um, and so that, that instantly tells us that there's a lot more to understand about the environmental control um, of the, the key active ingredient. 
we've been able to select and, and maintain just by taking small clippings and then growing them up. Uh, the, the team uh, do this so proficiently and so well, uh, keeping them clean and, and keeping some of the strains since as early as 2018. So we've had them in, in culture and they're growing so well even after that extended period of time. And the great thing is that when you actually do grow and do uh, maintain that environment, that bromoform concentration can get up over 1% uh, dry weight. So again, we're start, we understand that with more light and, and better control of conditions, we can actually enhance uh, that bioactive, which means ultimately that less seaweed is needed uh, to be uh, fed uh, to the cattle. But we know like uh, all good ecologists that there's always caveats. There's things that we need to be considering around how to control the growth and how to control the harvesting from a commercial point of view. The work uh, that we've done builds on, on the chemistry side, builds on all that uh, really seminal work that uh, Phil Fennickel's lab uh, from California did back in the 70s and early 80s. And so when you look right now in the Dictionary of Natural Products, there's 127 compounds that have been identified uh, from asparagopsis. Uh, and so a lot of those are, are halogenated ones. And so when we actually go in and try to quantify uh, the halogenated compounds, especially the volatile ones like bromoform, we can use gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. And basically, um, what we're looking at here is uh, once it's been extracted in methanol, uh, we can then inject it into the GCMS. And then this chromatogram shows over time the different peaks that, that come off. Uh, that's an internal standard. And, but the main peak that's there is bromoform. And there is the next most uh, abundant halomethane, so single carbon uh, and two bromines and a chlorine is dibromochloromethane. And that's so that just shows it's basically more than 95% um, of the halomethanes are actually bromoform. So when we're talking about what the bioactives are, um, especially for cattle at the higher concentrations, it's, it's those compounds. But there's so many more compounds in there and there's much more to be uh, learned when it comes to using different types of studies, uh, LCMS, so liquid chromatography, um, quantitative time of flight, we're doing metabolomics and we know that there's another 50 plus halo acids in every possible combination of acetones with different halogenation acids uh, with iodine and chlorine as well. It's this chemical powerhouse of, of a seaweed when it comes to making all these compounds. And for so long, I was so confused and still am actually about why is it producing so many of these compounds? We know that some of them uh, are quite antimicrobial and, and quite impactful, but I can guarantee you, of course, asparagopsis is not producing those compounds to reduce the methane in cattle. One of the things... Thank you for you to wrap up soon so that we can oh, yeah, get yeah, in yeah. the air to the Thanks. Thank you, Nicola. That's a couple of more slides. So we're looking at different ways to process the seaweed now. Um, can we actually come up with alternative methods? That's one of the, the key issues when it comes to um, actually the cost of doing it. And some of the ways is moving away from this idea of just trying to dry the seaweed is that when you actually have that moist air, you can dehumidify and take off a water stream. So we've been exploring um, these low temperature drying uh, systems because of the cost. Uh, the freeze drying is the key thing. It's always quite um, uh, sort of expensive uh, to do that for a number of reasons. But if the volatiles can actually be captured, um, it provides an alternative product pathway. And so a lot of the, the work that we've done has actually shown that when we get this water that comes off from drying, which would normally just be vented, you can actually start to use it for different things. You can use it uh, as an antibiotic treatment, potentially. You can use it to um, be seeded, uh, to be in, in basically uh, put back into cultures to help boost the production of the seaweed. So a different way of thinking allows you to, to focus on different applications. Some of the work that we've done now beyond cows is around these new applications with uh, trying to put or look at the uh, effects in feed. Um, so whether that's for salmon, where trials that we've shown going in at a similar concentration to the cattle, it's actually boosting the growth of fish 
by upwards of uh, 10%, 11 to 17%, depending on whether it's salmon or different uh, types of herbivorous fish. And that's all coming down to the crude extract. And likewise, we've just got some hot off the press uh, data where that same crude extract fed to shrimp, uh, basically prawns, uh, also in improves growth and boosts their immune system too. And it's really important. And the main thing I just wanted to highlight there, it's not bromoform. So there's opportunities to actually link back in different ways. So the final uh, couple of slides here are looking back to the impact and really uh, I wanted to put these up more for questions later. So I will move through them relatively quickly. Sustainable growth in Australia, is it possible? There's lots of environmental and regulatory um, risks around sea-based production. And we're starting to see the companies uh, move away from talking about sea-based as much as they did. What's going to be critical are life cycle analyses where we can actually try and look at, is it possible to do things on land? Um, can the hatcheries be produced? Can it actually be linked with other forms of aquaculture like corn production so that there is seaweed production going on at the same time? That'll have to be through partnerships. Is the minimum viable product um, going to be something that actually has a lower bromoform content? And that's actually not such a bad thing. And of course, disruption. We're seeing right now that new companies are being formed around the world who are just synthesizing bromoform and putting it into stable products and looking at taking that as a pathway. And these things are going to keep happening over time and time again. So there's a way to actually bring all of that processing back and to think of conceptually that it's one seaweed, but multiple products. There can be a feed additive that can be used. We can have antimicrobial compounds. We can feed it back so that recycling the water and we can still have uh, some methane impact. So you can have your cake and eat it too. And there's lots of great reasons for doing that when it comes to um, being able to link in with different products and match the productivity to the key things. So we need to have that genome based and the precision technology uh, to make it work. When I'm on the Sunshine Coast and our team here, we're always sort of thinking north, thinking about the tropics, thinking about the warm areas where we know seaweed production is culturally uh, and um, economically so important. Uh, but they will need different temperature and salinity uh, tolerance strains and we'll need lots of different partnerships with different countries and governments in those areas. So I think that's fantastic. And the last couple of slides here is that when it comes to global impact, we're obviously very focused on uh, cattle and, and, and methane when we talk about asparagopsis. But the, the reality is that seaweeds fit so beautifully with the sustainable development goals. There's an existing um, industry in Indonesia based on capophycus and gracilaria, which is on the right. Um, and they're, they're there, there's hundreds of thousands of seaweed farmers. There's important livelihood angles. There are places in the Pacific Islands where seaweed farming is yet to actually start. But if something like asparagopsis and a new investment can start to produce hatcheries and facilities where they can grow all different types of seaweeds, then their food and, and traditional uh, crops can also uh, be worked with. So just to leave you with these points, what's the minimum viable product for asparagopsis? Is it just a feed additive in a compound feed that you don't see? Maybe it's not a methane product. Can we actually adopt that biorefinery model where there's multiple products and ultimately pave the way for what could be the six species of seaweed? We've got Capophycus, Eukima, uh, we've got Peropia and uh, Pophyra, there's Laminaria and Saccharina, there's Gracilaria. But what else is this? If not now, then when are we going to get a new species that happens at scale? But we've got to be aware of all these big uh, potential disruptions that will come from synthetic products or synthetic biology. And so really learning to stay ahead of the curve. So, so thank you for the opportunity to, to talk. One of the great things of working on seaweed is they're beautiful. Uh, and our artistic friends love working with them. Uh, it doesn't take much to put some under the microscope and make it beautiful. And even uh, Bing, uh, chat uh, can organize a nice little image down the bottom there. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Okay, I guess it's my turn. And uh, thank you, Nick. I, I, I know, Nicola, that my uh, five minutes went down to probably one minute to talk briefly about, um, yeah, so to talk briefly about um, who I am and my work. So most of the people working on Asparagopsis or, you know, know me in person or have come across my name uh, with um, 
from my work on Asparagopsis aquaculture 20 years ago. So this is me sitting side uh, on the side of the to two thousand several 2000 liter tanks back in 2003. Uh, at that time, I uh, was doing my PhD on seaweed aquaculture and the Asparagopsis proved to be the the best species from the multiple species we, we, we tested. So I kind of run this system with uh, uh, several 2000 liter tanks and the 100 liter tanks for farming Asparagopsis for, for five years in a row. That was a break in summer due to high temperatures, but I would restart the next year and we would have a uh, nine year, uh, nine month uh, per year production of Asparagopsis. And we did all kind of research on optimizing the farming of the seaweed you know, on bioremediation of the effluents of the fish farm, on biomass production, biochemistry. At the moment, the biomass had application for the cosmetic industry in France, and that was our main focus to provide good quality biomass for the industry. So at that time, 20 years ago, I met another crazy PhD student working on Asparagopsis on the other side of the world, and that was Nick, and our passion for Asparagopsis took me over to James Cook University, where I spent the next six years working and developing and doing research on land-based seaweed aquaculture, um, multiple tanks, multiple systems, different um, environments on using effluent and wastewater for multiple industries. And um, and ironically, so at that time, the, 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 the we tried to produce asparagopsis in our systems, but it didn't work as successful as it did in Portugal. And, and this is, you know, part of the uh, of the difficulty of of um, of dealing with asparagopsis, and Nick mentioned it very well there. Uh, that's the strains. That is the strain variability. There's the environmental conditions that are completely different that can affect the outputs. Um, ironically enough, when the PhD student on that work on the asparagopsis on uh, methane as a methane inhibitor, that was my uh, coincided with my time uh, that I left James Cook University, and when asparagopsis became one of the most world famous seaweed. Um, I started this um, project uh, with um, with a fish, uh, the CEO of a fish farmer here in Vietnam, Australis, where we aim to uh, develop the knowledge pathway to make asparagopsis cultivation a reality. And and I highlight here ocean bays because. You, you might ask why on earth you've spent 15 years working on uh, land-based seaweed aquaculture and, and you started a project on ocean-based. And the, and the answer for me at that time, and considering my experience on land-based was pretty straightforward. Um, Nick already mentioned that the majority of the seaweed industry and uh, aquaculture is based, uh, is ocean-based. And is not only ocean-based, it's concentrated in Asia. And so that's kind of the main, um, the main reason we are uh, located in Vietnam with uh, Southeast Asia all around us, but also other countries like Japan, South Korea and, and China that are main uh, players in the seaweed industry. And uh, that for me was what makes sense if we want to make this scalable and a reality, looking at, uh, at the statistics, it makes sense to do this way. And, and my experience on, on land base also showed me that there are high production costs and it's much more difficult to scale it. And bear in mind, I still think land-based aquaculture of seaweeds as a place, but uh, not for this vast uh, large scale application. So we also focus on taxiformis, not just because it's the species, the warm uh, asparagopsis species that is present in the region, but also because it's much widely distributed worldwide. So that gives us an opportunity if we're successful to expand to, to other locations. However, the problem is that there's, there was nothing done on the asparagopsis ocean-based cultivation, taxiformis, and so we have to start all over again. And so this is this quadrant, just to put in perspective where we sit here, greener grazing, we kind of went uh, betting on the moonshot. Basically, we are trying to do something that was never done before, which was farming in the ocean, the gametophyte of the tropical species. Most of the players have focused on, probably some of them started trying to do ocean farming, but they realize that it's not a straightforward line. So they focus mainly on the land-based cultivation both of both species being the cold water or the more warm tropical water uh, because that heals the must, fa must faster results and access to biomass. 
So we are kind of sitting alone here, but we think it makes sense. It, it makes sense that we do this again based on what I just said before. It's in Asia and it's in the ocean, and we think that's the only way we can do this at scale at an affordable price if we are successful. And to be successful, so we have we started in 2018, and we are now have almost six years of mostly R&D and we have completed over 300 studies on the aquaculture. And most of these studies are actually on the land base, on the seed stock, the hatchery and the nursery. So the, the idea is that if we do this right, if we do this consistently right and we can produce good quality material to deploy in the ocean, then we can you know, just uh, site selection and, and install multiple hatcheries and supply seeding material to local farmers and uh, with that also contribute for the Im improvement of livelihood of local communities in Southeast Asia. This is very hard. And, and, and it, it, during these six years, uh, we have been gone through a lot of uh, you know, challenges and tribulations. And we you know, big, gave a big jump after we uh, collaborated with our team from Orti Ortimar from the Netherlands, where they have a long, long time experience on, on breeding and propagation of seaweed. And they, do the same for other species in uh, mostly on the kelp, on the northern uh, northern Europe uh, species. They provide high quality material for for local farmers. And this collaboration, with this collaboration, we hope to boost the good, the quality of material that we are producing on our land based system to pr to provide uh, good quality seedlings for multiple farmers here in Asia. So thank you so much for these two or three minutes, Nicole. I thought I think. I talk fast enough to present this in a, in enough time to for for some good Q Q and I. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leonardo. We have time for precisely one question. So whoever puts up their hand in Zoom, the first, um, please uh, please do so, and then we can. Uh, so Thierry Chopin wins the race. Thierry, please go ahead, uh, pose a very quick question, and let us know who you're posing it to, please. Uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning. Um, or to both of them. Um, it seems that at the end of presentation of uh, Nick, uh, there is a call for application for diversification. Uh, I mean, diversification of the application of uh, asparagopsis to do more than the methane things. So, um, what what does that mean when there is a call to do more than uh, methane reduction? And for me also is, um, I was hoping to hear if there was a matching uh, scale between, uh, I would say the, the genie has left the bottle for asparagopsis, uh, but what is the size of the uh, cow production, and especially uh, when it's producing pastures? Uh, how do we match those two stories? Um, so I see at the end a call for doing more than methane, and then how do we match the two? Nick, go ahead. <laughs> Quickly. Yes, yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't have the answers, which is why it was a call, Gary, but uh, I, I think it's a call that um, it's more of from a profound philosophical point of view. We, we can't have hundreds of millions of dollars being invested in asparagopsis and have no outcome. Imagine how bad that is going to be for the next wave of seaweeds coming through. Um, we know that asparagopsis is one of the fastest growing seaweeds on land uh, when it comes, when Leonardo talked about, and we know that there are some hurdles, but optimism around doing it in, in the sea, but probably not at the scale like you were saying, which, which I completely agree with, where we're going to be dealing with more than one billion, dealing with more than one billion cattle. So we have to wind back the scope of our claims and focus on, in, in my opinion, smaller, what I was saying, that minimum viable product, viable product trying to actually get um, revenue, selling the seaweed for it to do a job for customers and good things will probably come from that. Leonardo. Oh, I, I, I totally agree with you, Nick. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm an asparagopsis lover and I really catch up that, uh, uh, that in your last slide that you, the goal is to make asparagopsis the sixth uh, seaweed 
that is farmed. I mean, of course, there's more than five, but it's six group of seaweed. And I, I still think that if we can make it at scale in Asia, we may still uh, target uh, the methane market. Uh, but obviously, there's going to be, if especially if you farm it in land or in the ocean, there's going to be different products at different prices that might fit into different markets. And I, I hope that's going to be the future of Asparagopsis farming, both on land and in the ocean for multiple applications. Thank you both. I see, Philippe, you've put up your hand. We're in wrap-up mode. So um, whatever your intervention is, can you make it quick? Because we do have a few things that we've got to say before we before we close. Just a quick question uh, about uh, the environmental safety of uh, cultivating asparagopsis uh, at sea, in fact, uh, in open sea, uh, especially Leonardo, you are, of course, uh, extending the, the asparagopsis cultivation in, in tropical countries, but uh, recently there were some also funded projects to investigate the potential of um, invasive uh, strains of um, asparagopsis taxiformis, which uh, and there were some concern about uh, the competition between the seabeds and uh, the corals. So what could you see about that? Um, that's a that's a good point. Obviously, we, we we are working in countries where there is native asparagopsis, so there's no uh, introduction of the species, and 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 it's spread wide, it's widespread in in in, uh, in tropical countries, uh, but also in South Korea and in China and so on. So obviously, th th there are many questions related with the potential ecologic impacts of asparagopsis or even other seaweed aquaculture, and that's as will have to be addressed. But I think. That should not be the a question that will stop us to move forward and and try to understand what are the benefits and the you know the pros and the cons and the life cycle assessment and so on and so on. So I, I hear you, Philip, and and I, I know you know for coming from Europe, I know the impact that Asparagopsis introduction had on on the natural habitat in Europe. Uh, but um, again, we never know if that's going to be the same in the tropics. And from my experience here in Vietnam, when I dive in Vietnam. It's actually very difficult to find asparagopsis, so I don't see it as as a, as an, an invasive behavior or, or something like that here. But again, we never know. We we need to pay attention to those things. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure that this was just <clears throat> a foretaste. I'm sure that many of you have questions, so please do feel free to send your questions to um, through through the chat. That's great. We can make sure that you get answers after the fact. So if Azadine can just drop the secretariat email into the chat, then we will make sure to relay them and then we'll uh, you'll get answers either from Nick or from Leonardo or from both of them. So please put your questions in the chat or send them to the Global Seaweed Coalition Secretariat afterwards. I really want to thank, on behalf of the coalition, I wanna thank both of you for unpacking these issues, the issues scientifically, um, and note that this is highly relevant and timely for the climate conversations, especially the upcoming COP28, and particularly so for the food system, which contributes some one third of uh, human produced greenhouse gases. So solving the methane problem could go a long way towards solving the human produced greenhouse gas, is gas issues uh, going beyond cows. And by the way, Nick, love that silver bullet uh, image. We, we may want to take that from you uh, if you don't mind, if it's, if it's not copyrighted. So, um, so thanks to everybody for joining. Thank you. We have run out of time uh, and that's unfortunate because there's clearly so much more to talk about. Huge thanks to both Nick, uh, Professor Nick Paul and to Dr. Leonardo Mata for your, uh, for your great presentations. We really appreciate your helping. Uh, you're helping us all to understand the the at least a beginning of understanding of this complex and highly relevant topic. So thanks to all of you for attending. Thanks for um, for your questions. Thanks to uh, my colleagues in the Global Seaweed Coalition, Philippe, for your scientific leadership. Melanie, who's now joined us as the scientific officer, and Azadine for uh, for your su support in organizing the event, and Sophia for your support in organizing the event. 
A quick promotional word, if you have not already become a member of the coalition, please do so. It is free and you'll get access to our biweekly newsletter, as well as other information and the member collaboration space. So, and of course, exclusive members only access to events. And I hinted at the latest news, our call for proposals has been launched. It's open for applications until January 20th. We'll support eight to 10 project winners and they'll be focusing on the safe and sustainable development of seaweed. Please look at the technical details if you're interested. All the relevant information for applicants is available on our website. And if you have any questions whatsoever on our call, please again, send an email to the general secretariat email or reach out to our scientific officer, Milani. We hope that you found this event both useful and enjoyable. And please watch our website and that weekly newsletter for upcoming news. And in the meantime, uh, wishing you a wonderful day. We look forward to seeing you in our next event. Thank you very much. Goodbye.